There you go. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Scottish Property Podcast. My name is Stephen Clark and I'm joined as always by my co-host Nick Ponty. How you doing mate? Sorry, we've got to apologise to people. We've missed a week um, where I was struck down with the Covid and I just couldn't bring myself to the mic. So we're in back. Eight, in 18 months maybe we've missed one week's episode. That's, that's pretty impressive mate. Consistency is the key. I know, no, I know. So I had a few messages from people saying, what's happened to the podcast? Where are you guys? So obviously that's a good thing because it shows that we're doing something right. So yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I was just saying to you off here as well, the downloads remained quite good as well, showing that people are still catching up with the content and it's not, there's nothing really be not concerned that we missed one, one week. Um, so this week's episode, we have Chris Goimer um, on. Now, Chris Goimer was an offshore, he was an offshore driller who worked offshore for for 18 years and they went full time in property and as a disclaimer and I hate and you know I've not brought anyone on from the workshop stroke mastermind group <laughs> this was on mine and I kind of made sure like look don't don't talk about it keep it away like I kind of give them a bit of warning and this the podcast we really don't want to use the podcast for promoting any of the businesses we do and um, Chris is a guy in his own right he's doing phenomenal stuff and um, but we got a good chat didn't we yeah no it was good so like the thing I like about Chris, and I've spoken to him before because we had him on a Zoom call way back in lockdown, um, is that he is just, he's dead modest. He doesn't, he doesn't kind of talk, talk anything up. He's just very chilled. He's a chilled guy. You don't see him posting away on social media and all that and raving about all the deals that he's doing. He's very low profile, but he's actually really doing the business. And I know that because I know that you know him very well indeed and you you're actually working along with him on certain things as well so you know how much he's doing and how much he doesn't shout about it but we're trying to tell him he needs to shout about it a wee bit more because obviously he'll he'll attract investment and all the rest of it but yeah yeah. absolutely it's an an ethos ethos that I kind of put into the mastermind group as well like a lot of the guys on there are very much like Chris they're very nice humble guys they're building a business first before they start shouting about the bullshit that people do when they come off a course that shit about what we're not doing let's fucking put fluff out on social media and try to attract investors and, and talk about stuff we're doing whereas these guys are actually building phenomenal portfolios are doing cracking deals they're building property businesses and then when they start shouting about it and then they get used to marketing and social media and putting this out then they'll attract investors based on the merit of what they've done their track record their, how credible they are what they've actually got you know so it's a different concept or a different way we're, we're trying to do it and, and Chris is Chris is a total you're right he's a key a key player now, and he's, he's exactly the kind of guy I like working with, very humble. Yeah, uh, it was interesting like, speaking about the, the transition from the earning over 100 grand a year um, to, you know, basically earning nothing, <laughs> you know, and like how much he's like, I don't need all this money. I don't need all this. I can live quite comfortably off like, what was it, like 700 quid a month or something like that. Obviously, he's got a family now. He need a little bit more than that. If you 700 quid a month on nappies and milk yeah. just on <laughs> twins... <laughs> It's, it's funny because um, the very first ever mastermind um, event that I hosted about 18 months ago, um, Chris was the first one that wanted on board, the first one that came along. And um, I had this interest in realisation. So we're, we're kind of setting the goals out and we're going around the room. And, and, and I know Chris, I met Chris about nine, ten years ago offshore. He was uh, working as an assistant general when I was working in subsea. Um, and, I, and I knew him, I, I could stay in touch with him. We both like jujitsu, we've got, got, got quite a lot in common. And I knew his salary. So when he wanted to join the mastermind group, I'm thinking, oh, great, here's somebody that wants to fucking quit offshore. They're making 10 grand a month and they want to make 10 grand a month in property. Like, nah, you're not going to make that quite quickly. And Chris was really, really humble. And the car that he came in reflected this as well. The clothes he was wearing, he's, you know, he's not a flashy guy and stuff like that. And, and he quite happily just stated his, his financial freedom figure. And he says, look, my financial freedom figure from property is, uh, is £1,800 a month. As soon as I get that cash flow, I'm out. And, uh, and this was in the September, October, uh, around 18 months ago. And by the June, the following year, he had quit his job offshore. So he had achieved the kind of cash flow. Um, and it wasn't huge goals. It wasn't massive. But he did realise he didn't need that money. He didn't need that huge salary. He didn't need that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's false. It's bullshit. He needed the, He wanted financial freedom. He wanted to he wanted to live a life on by his design and his, on, on his terms. So I really liked that about him straight away. And I knew he was going to make it as soon as I saw him as soon as I spoke to him I was like oh, he's definitely going to do it there's, there's no doubt in my mind yeah no it's it's great and he's also talking about how he's doing this uh, commercial his first sort of commercial deal as well in Aberdeen City Centre and he goes into a bit of detail about that so he's got some exciting things on the in the pipeline 
Definitely, and you, you did try and drag the numbers around, but because he is such a humble guy, he, would, he, he didn't share a huge amount of numbers. I think he did share the details of his flip profit, he's, the first flip he's doing at the moment. Um, he's been focused on building his portfolio. Now he's doing a flip, where he thinks he's going to get about 80, 100 grand. I think we managed to get that out of, out of him. But um, yeah, he's quite reserved, but uh, the chat's really, really good. It's humble. It's... It's, it's, it's the real stuff, and, and we did ask him tips as well on how he how he works on uh, how he, how he keeps a refurb budget tight, but still producing a high quality end result. Yeah, cool. So let's go into the interview with Chris Goimer. So thank you for joining us, Chris Goimer, on the Scottish Property Podcast. It's great to have you on, mate. Thanks, guys. It's uh, great to be here. Good to see you, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Let's get right in, mate. Tell us, tell us, and tell the listeners um, a bit about a bit about you and how you got started in property. Uh, so I'm uh, based up in Aberdeen. Uh, I worked 18 years uh, offshore in the oil industry and in the drilling side. Uh, packed it in last last June. Uh, secure job, six figure salary. Uh, everyone thought it was mental, but uh, <laughs> I basically just wanted to have more time at home. For myself in there. Eight, 18 years, mate, offshore. I, I think I shivered when you just said that. It's, it's hard, is it? That's hard work. That's, that's nine years of my life away from home. Nine and years. You're not, that, you're not that old, mate. So that's, a, that's a good chunk of your fucking life gone. Uh, Excuse me, yes. It's almost like a, what, a quarter of my life. Uh, it's sure, a metal box. So. You know, Matt, a lot of listeners are related to this because we, I get, I get, you know, people get in touch with me quite a lot that listen to the podcast that work offshore and you know, we've got a similar background to us as well. So a lot of listeners will completely resonate with that that length of time offshore and uh, and probably be quite impressed that you're doing something different and how and probably be really interested in hear your story. So so what made you what what was a light bulb moment that you wanted to kind of away from offshore and what and what made you think that property was the, the answer? <laughs> I've told the story a few times now. It was uh, it was after the kind of a round of redundancies went through. Uh, I came back from the rig, came back to the rig, and I got told basically that my job was safe and nothing to worry about. And I was in my room having a shower, and it was just kind of, it was exactly that light bulb moment. It was a click, I was mid shower, and I thought, nah, that's it, I I'm finished, I've, I've had enough, you know. Uh, again, people think I I'm, I'm crazy because I was, it was a, such a good position at my work, I was, I was a driller offshore where people work most of their lives to get to. And once they're at that kind of position, that, that's some happy, that's some set for life, you know, not caring the world about, about bills. But I thought, no, I, I don't see myself spending my next 20, 25 years of my life stuck offshore here, missing out on this kind of, on life back onshore. So I thought, I thought property was the way to go. And uh, well, that's me now. See somebody that's not worked in it, obviously, but I've not worked in the oil and gas industry, right? But obviously yourself and Stephen, you know, have. And like from an outsider looking in, you know, you look at these guys, you think, that must be quite a good life. You know, you only need to work half your life. The rest of the time you get off to do whatever you want and you've got all this money and it seems really well paid. But talking to you guys, you've always got quite a kind of negative view on it. And what what is it that it's really, that, that, that it's, it's not as good as what maybe people see on the outside? I think initially it is, it is it's kind of the, the honestly, it's, it's the, the shiny things. You know, it's uh, the expensive cars, the nice holidays, the uh, six month a year off, uh, good salary. It's It all sounds really, really impressive. And it, it, in fact, it is, it is, it is really good. But the amount of things you miss out on in life back home weddings, birthdays, friends' parties there's so many things you miss out on. It's, it's unbelievable. And and I guess after, after a few, you know, times of missing out on sort of big events, you're sort of thinking to yourself, is this all really worth it? Is that is that kind of what goes through your mind? Exactly. It's a for me it's a it's a trade-off. It's yeah. I'm selling my time for, for, for money. But it's that's it's time I can never get back. And 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 and, and I think uh, that's that's the negative it's a lot of things as well. Like you're you've kind of got to detach yourself from life. Like if you're back and after a few years you start missing that one birthdays and Christmases and weddings and all this kind of stuff and anniversaries you kind of got to detach yourself a little bit and be a little bit numb to the point you, the fact you've actually got a life just to make it quite comfortable go offshore switch off the life when you're offshore and then when you come back you're starting you've got the dread of oh in three weeks time I'm way back offshore again 
to be in a jail cell in the middle of the North Sea or wherever you're working, you know, in a single cabin. I can probably share it with some other guy. Like, it's, it's a kind of prison sentence. Then you, as soon as you, these thoughts start to creep in, you start to see the. it's not as shiny, it's not as great as you think. You, you think. And I think, for me, is I never saw any happy stories. Like, I, like the, the, the positions that Chris was in were phenomenal. You know, your, your, your tool push, I don't know I am, right at the back of that on fucking silly money. I never saw any happy stories. I never saw anybody retiring at 45, 50 feet up, nice big house, nice car. All I saw was guys in their 60s, 70s still working these positions because their wife divorced them, took half their money, or their second wife divorced them, and they're, they're having to rebuild again. They can't get a job back on shore because they go from 300 grand to 30 grand, you know, and their kids hate them because they've not got a relationship with their kids because they've missed half their life and stuff like that. I never saw any happy stories. No one ever... No one ever done it right for me. No one ever thought, right, I'll make the big buck, I'll bank it any property, I'll, I'll, I'll make investments, I'll set myself up with a business or whatever, and I'll get out of there and I'll enjoy my life. It was always this, as soon as you got into the, the, the trap, I think people just couldn't get out of the trap because the money was so good. Time off was quite good. Um, so yeah, that, that, was, that was me. So you can, your, your lifestyle gets adjusted to your, to your, your salary. Mm. But the more money you make, the more kind of luxurious things you buy. And it's, I've been there, I've done it, you know, I've been on nice holidays, I've, Spent money in expensive restaurants. I don't, I'm not shying away from it. It, it was good. Yeah, it was, it was great. But for for longevity, it's 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 the wrong way. It's the wrong way to go, in, in my opinion. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting point. So so property. What what got you started? What got you moving? So I'm assuming before you threw the towel in um, for the for the for a decent salary, you already had a bit of a, a backup plan or something in place. Yeah. So we started with a, a kind of a first uh, a first property in. Uh, in Aberdeen, a small kind of one bed flat. And it was bought okay. It was bought fairly cheap, but again, didn't have a kind of right education on it. So overspent a little bit on it. Uh, it's funny, it produces it's pretty good uh, monthly kind of cash flow now uh, because we kind of push, push, push the standard really high. I mean, it's probably, it's probably one of the best uh, rental for the area. So, but we saw what's possible. You know, we thought, it, it, it was kind of like a, a, again just change my perception on the uh, about working offshore. So if, if I could be onshore, have a few properties, and uh, just like have like a passive income, that's much more appealing to me than working offshore for sure. So I'm assuming you have to you have to reduce your your standard of life to account for the kind of huge drop in salary go from an offshore driller to a property investor. Was that Massive. perfect? Massively. Yeah, yeah, absolutely massive. Uh, I went through before, well, as soon as I came back on shore that first trip, I went through all my expenses, uh, my bank account printed off like the past a year, and I threw my red pen and just deleted everything I didn't need. Sky TV, uh, monthly uh, subscriptions for like, gyms, everything, you know. And I think I saved myself about 1,800 quid a month on outgoings. Unnecessary outgoings. And don't that's, that's a huge amount of money. It's, it's massive, you know. But it was just utter crap I was buying that I didn't need. Can you give us an idea, like what? How much were you actually bringing in when you were on the on the offshore? About oh, about 100, 115,000 a year. Right. Okay. So significant. Good chunk. good chunk. Aye. So good chunk. So from going from that to having to score out all your subscriptions and that. So what, did you have a figure in mind then that you were gonna? You know, get down to where you just you obviously you have a figure where you're like, right, I'm going to try and make this property thing work. How much do I actually need to have a decent standard of life, just so people listening can I get an idea? I guess Nick, I, I went from that from from earning that money to earning pretty much hardly anything now, but I don't feel like my standard of living's changed. It's, it's my perception; it's changed now. You know, mm-hmm. I, I went, God, I, I can survive on now. Seven hundred pound a month, and people will laugh at that. But I mean, easily I can survive in seven hundred quid a month. Is that because you're passive income from property now? Yeah, paying, yeah. paying your way, covering your costs. Yeah, Aye. yeah. No, that, that makes sense. I, I, I completely wholeheartedly agree with that. You know, the more money you spend, and I the more money you earn in a salary, the more money you just spunk, and you get used to that lifestyle, and it is unnecessary. And you don't you don't enjoy it just living for like, nights out or hot fancy holidays or a fancy car. Um, absolutely. So before you pulled the trigger, did you had you managed to work up to your your kind of passive income goal that you that you set yourself? 
Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I very much uh, just jump in the deep end and see what happens, kind of person. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll make it work. Doesn't matter what kind of position I get put in, I'll, I'll make it work. And, and this is, the, we're, we're not talking you've only just quit your job offshore. You've, you've done this over a year ago now, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, June last year. Aye. So you're, so you're, uh, aye, so you've made it work or you're making it work. I am. Still yeah. in the process, of course, still in the process. Aye. Working process. So, so what's your main strategy in property then? Oh, good question. Good question. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have, uh, I don't say I have a, a strategy as such. Uh, what we've done, in the in, in the past, with uh, really with buying, re, uh, refurbishing, then refinancing, mm -hmm. that's what we've done for the past few. Uh, but we've also got started into uh, the commercial side. Um, myself and uh, one of my business partners, Eric, have just bought a, a commercial unit in Aberdeen City Centre. So we're going to get into the commercial side now as well. So again, I, I wouldn't have about like a once kind of. One strategy for sure. But your but your main strategy is building your your buy to let portfolio, just vanilla buy to let portfolio at the moment. Just now, yeah, just now. But that, that's that's going to switch, Kate. Yeah. It's not switching just now for sure. Yeah, because we've had conversations before when you reach that kind of passive income target, which you, from your portfolio that you're going to just switch to bigger deals and and you know commercial investments and other other strategies that cash flow and make a little bit more income. Yeah, sure. So you're buying in Aberdeen then, Chris? Yeah. Of course, my home city. I know so like, I'm, all, I'm always curious, like, because you guys are obviously part of this mastermind group, right? So how is there, like, enough deals to go around and, like, are you not all, like, turning up at the viewings and, like, bumping into each other? Like, so how, do, how does that all work? <laughs> yeah, currently in Aberdeen, there's about 3,500 properties for sale. So there's plenty of deals. There's plenty to go around. There's plenty to go around. <laughs> there's plenty to go around. Nah, nice one. Um, no, that's good. So, so like, I mean, how have you been getting on with the refinancing and the, the remortgaging and stuff like that? Any issues there? Or has that been all kind of quite plain sailing? It's, it's been pretty good, yeah. We had, uh, I wish I had a mortgage going through. When I, when I originally kind of quit the job, we had a mortgage going through just at that time. And uh, we kind of came and got a bit of a dilemma. I had my old salary uh, logged in for the, for the mortgage. And it was like about a week later that I quit. They were sitting in this kind of, in this kind of limbo of what do we do? Do we, do we contact the mortgage company, let them know that we've had a change of circumstance or do we just cross our fingers and hope for the best? And it was, it was quite a hard, it was quite a hard thing to, to choose between, you know, because it was a property we'd been after for months, a, a really nice property in Aberdeen. But on the other hand, it's like, you know, the last thing we want to do is kind of, start going down that kind of road you know so when i'm just telling uh, telling the mortgage company and uh, they're, actually, they're actually happy enough with it so we still got the mortgage so because that's one of the things people say isn't it sometimes they hold on to that job because it becomes lending starts becoming more difficult if you've not got that kind of like sort of regular uh salary sort of thing so you haven't found too many issues then no not yet yeah, not at all that's good yeah that's a good bit um, and you, you do your refurbs to a phenomenally high standard. So have you got any tips for the listeners on how to kind of keep control of that refurb budget and keep that budget tight, but still producing that kind of stand, a high standard of um, quality product? Yeah, I think it's just sourcing the right materials, mm. for sure. Sourcing the right materials and uh, just looking at the kind of current trends that's, that's going on in the, in the market. Uh, we certainly we don't kind of copy any, any, anyone or anything, but we're just uh, trying to... The way I kind of look at a refurb is, would I want to stay there? No, from once I've completed the refurb, I don't do it to, to, to uh, a low budget. It's, it's, would I like to stay there? If I can tick the boxes, would I like to stay there? Then I, I'm quite happy with it. Yeah, we're trying, we're trying to dismiss that um, that old saying. It's just a rental, don't we? We try and make them it's horrible. High quality. It's a horrible saying. It's a horrible thing that people think that because you're a tenant, you should have a substandard quality of living. Um, so, so I like the ethos that you've got with that as well. Is it, tenants are customers. Mm -hmm. tenancy of customers. So if, if you run a business saying, oh, basically, fuck the customers, you know, you, you run a bad business in my kind of point of view. Yeah. What, what, what I want to know is, I want to know who started off the, the trend of the wood panelling, you know, the kind of, I don't know if it's MDF and it's built out with the mouldings or is it like, 
the feature wall, the wood paneling feature wall. I see it in all your Instagram posts. So somebody must have started it. Who was it? We've got a job lot on a on a crate of wood. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> we can't get the materials anymore, so we won't be doing them anymore. <laughs> they were nice anyway. I like them. Uh, I think it was I think it was you your Marshall Street one about maybe 18 months ago, was it? Uh oh, do we do it there? I, I can't remember, Stu. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember. So what's happening with materials anyway? Because like things have shot up. Are you actively doing any refubs at the moment, Chris? What how yeah. you have you been finding that things have shot up? Like, give us can you give us any examples? Uh, some some timber products have shot up that like, almost doubled. Doubled in yeah. Wow. That's that's something that's I mean that's really important for people who are entering into price and refubs. If you place a refurb you know? like two months ago and you go to price it now, you you'll be in for a big shock. You probably you probably be up twenty percent, twenty five percent on your, your refurb costs. Yeah. Also heard stories about builders having to uh, resubmit quotes as well. You know, if you got a builder out a few months ago, then obviously they're going to want to relook at that price. For sure. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. Everything's more expensive now. Everything, even even things in B and Q, boxes of screws, thirty three percent they're up. Thirty three yeah. percent in the space of two months. Nick just touched on that a little bit there, mate, about you know you manage kind of multiple projects on the go at any given time. If you got any tips to listeners on on kind of how you deal with that and you got any systems or processes and and you know how you kind of juggle multiple projects all all, the, all at one time. Uh, being proactive, yeah, not, not not waiting for for problems to occur, trying to stay ahead of everything, uh, keeping all the guys, all the trades guys, well informed of what's going on, good communication with them. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to have your materials on site for the guys working, but it's a fine balance between having materials on site and having the place jammed full of materials so the guys can't work. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, actually. A lot of people do make that mistake. <clears throat> Get all the finishing materials on site and you, you, you know, the roughing's not even done, plaster's not even done, and you have to move kitchens and bathrooms and flipping scuttings and faces all about from room to room just to get in, get any, anywhere. So yeah, that's a really good point. The only thing that's going to do is go piss off the trades. So the chairs have in the price for the job to do, put up a stud partition, for instance, and they come on site, then they've got bloody cookers, kitchens, bathrooms, tiles to move to get to that stud partition. And, you know, it's, it's just going to piss them off in the, in, in the long run, you know? No, no, that's a good point. Really good point. Um, any, any kind of current projects you're working on right now you want to share? Yeah, we're currently working on a flip project in, in West End Aberdeen. Uh, it's a first flip, so we're quite excited for it. Uh, I think we're probably about a month away from being complete, give, give or take a few weeks. Right. What, um, can you run us through the numbers on that? Sure, so I uh, purchased for 180k, uh, two bed flat, it's about 116 square metres, uh, plus I've got attic space of another 25 square metres, so it's a fairly big property. Uh, the refurb is going to be about 30k on it. And um, we're hoping for a, a kind of end value of about 300k. So we're looking for right. we're looking to an like 80 and 100k profit, give or take. I guess it's all going to depend on the, the market at the time. Nice, man. That's a, that's a phenomenal profit on that on a flip on a flat as well in Aberdeen. And I'm who, assuming who because of where the market. Target, who do you think your target market is going to be on that? Like y young executives, uh, maybe young couple where I just starting a family. Because we're right next to all the private schools. Uh, it's on St. Swithin Street. Uh, the bottom of the road is Ashley, Ashley Road Primary School. It's like one of the most sought after primary schools in Aberdeen. And people actually move to that kind of area just to get so their kids get into that school. Hmm. Uh, Sp speaking to Stephen there, actually, just before we came on, he's like, uh, you know, he, he's loving Aberdeen. He says that he could quite easily live there. But, um, yeah, just uh, talking to you guys, it has kind of... I just I've, I do like the look of it right and as an investment but I just keep seeing like everywhere else in the country keeps on going up like by crazy amounts and Aberdeen's still like flatlining at the bottom there it's just like which is possibly the best time to buy but I don't know what what in terms of Aberdeen let's talk about Aberdeen since you're you know that's your patch Chris you know what, yeah, what that's is not. your eh? <laughs> Is that? <laughs> that's not encouraging. We're trying to not encourage people to come to Aberdeen now. <laughs> so there's too many of us. I'm only joking. Sorry, sorry, Nick. Go on. <laughs> I mean, like, um, let's just talk about you know Aberdeen because you know it seems like the only place in the country where you can actually get a deal at the moment. So, 
um, you know, how you find it. Are you, are you going out in viewings and now is there a, a kind of influx of coach loads of people coming up from the central belt to try and scoop up a deal? Like what's happening there? Is it still quite, quite easy to get a deal? Like what's going on? No, it's, it's still fairly easy. Uh, obviously, there's still get, there's investors coming up from down south, uh, but I think knowing the local market helps so much. Yeah, uh, the England think on, on paper, I think they've found a good deal uh, in a certain bit of, bit of Aberdeen. On paper, it works hundred percent, but I know that okay, that's a crap street. I would never, never buy a property there. And and what what can, what can happen where you know things start start really coming up in terms of you know prices and appreciation in Aberdeen because at the moment you know throughout the country we're seeing you know prices go up ten percent you know in some regions and stuff like that what what do you think needs to happen in Aberdeen for things to really start coming back up because obviously you know long term people want to try and make a bit in capital growth on their property portfolio as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Aberdeen got property is very much tied to the oil price. It's, it's got its, it's own unique kind of microclimate here. Uh, back, back in back in the few years ago, Nick, you pay, pay, pay a property for rent in Aberdeen, you'd have a line of people at the door, knocking your door down to get the property off you. Mm. I mean, it, it, it will go back. Maybe not to the height it was before, but it will definitely go back. There's a lot more um, <clears throat> investment in Aberdeen as well. To kind of go away from the oil and gas industry, there's a lot of investment getting made into the renewable energies, and um, obviously it's still got a huge student population still there, so that's not really been affected by by the oil price uh, drop in the last few years. For sure, Aberdeen's got two universities, RGU and Aberdeen Uni. Aberdeen Uni's been there for 526 years, so I don't think it's going anywhere in the next few years. Yeah, I think if they can sort of nail the kind of renewables industry and in that. And can I get some sort of growth there? And big companies bring their staff in as well, will make a huge difference. What uh, are you able to touch on the commercial? You, you were talking about the commercial deal, or is that still kind of under wraps at the moment? You know, that's fine. Uh, we uh, we bought a commercial unit in the city centre of Aberdeen, uh, 5,700 square feet. What do you uh, plan doing with that? So that's going to be. Depending on planning, of course, Nick, but uh, that's going to be, I think, a cafe, deli upstairs, serviced office space, like uh, co-working spaces through the back, and downstairs going to have uh, a gym and some more serviced office spaces. Cool. You're going to be running the cafe? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's yet to be discussed. <laughs> we don't know whether to take it on ourselves or just going to farm it out. And we say it's going to, to, to be uh, discussed for sure. Our new hub and our new meeting spot. Oh, definitely. I, I think we've got such a good deal on it. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. We basically we bought it for £10.50 a square foot. City centre. Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, you, you struggle to get rental for that per year. But we've picked up a freehold for that. That's, that's pretty cool because like a lot of people see commercial as a, quite a scary thing. Do you know what I mean? But like you say, you've... You've just gone for it, so um, that, that's brilliant, mate. Really, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. Who do you? So who you? Who do you invest in? Have you got like? Is it? Um, you know, like, who, have you got joint venture partners or have you got investors? How do you kind of structure deals and things? Yeah, I've got a joint venture partner for the uh, Adelphi building. It's uh, with Eric and Kristen, uh, Z Eleven Properties. Right. Yeah. And how did you meet these guys? Well, they've been, been friends for years. Friends been from friends. previous. So you've yeah. already got that kind of trust there, in that, yeah. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Uh, and we've got some kind of investors we use for like the kind of purchases for the kind of residential stuff. Cool. But for, for sure, we definitely we need more because we're expanding fairly quickly. We're, we're basically running out of cash. All our kind of money is tied up in, in deals for ourselves. So <clears throat> it's, it's hard to expand without any, without any capital, for sure. Yeah. And, and how are you going about that? I mean, have you got, like, are you just trying to put things out on your social media profiles and things, or? Uh, I haven't so far, Nick, no, not at all. Yeah, you're uh, quite quiet on the social media, aren't you? Very you... quiet, yeah. But like, this, this is what I love about you, right? So you don't sh come out there and shout about it, but speaking to Stephen, Stephen knows you very well. You're very active and you're very, you're doing a lot of good things. So this is why it's great to get you on the podcast to expose what you're doing. So, yeah. 
I, I really I do need to up my social media game. Uh, for, for sure, it's, it's it's such a good tool. I, I know that, and I, I do understand that, but I, I, I can't I can't explain why I'm not doing it. I, I don't know. I don't know. You're, you're so busy doing the deals and doing the do mate. That you're uh, <laughs> yeah. do, the, do the shite and the fluff. <laughs> That's but, it. <laughs> it's a powerful tool for 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 growing and and, and bringing on a, a investors. And I'm assuming that's going to be the next stage for you. Then is bringing on more private investors to to grow bigger and bigger deals, go more into commercial, go more into bigger developments. For sure, yeah, we've got a couple of things in the pipeline that we're, we're definitely looking to look for investors for. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll be really keen to get some some new new faces on board. Yeah, no, it's good. And I'm assuming the ones you used before are, are just people in your network and people in your close kind of close vicinity. Yeah, yeah, people already know me. Yeah, uh, family and friends, that sort of thing. It's always, it's always easy to start with people that know, like, and trust you already, isn't it? Definitely, yeah, definitely. Like I say, the relationships already there, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, what's, go for it. Next, sorry. There you go. So, what's the kind of typical day for you then? Like, you know, what have you got? Give us a, a bit of a flavour of what's going on because we don't see it on your Instagram stories because you don't post it there, so we can't really keep track of you. But I presume you know you've got. Several projects going on. Like, what what's kind of typical day to day for Chris? Uh, well, just now we just as we mean uh, me me and my partner Ruth just uh, had twins a few weeks back. Congratulations, nice one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so <laughs> just now, so, <laughs> trying to get some sleep in. That that's a kind of main focus from a day just now. Uh, probably grab a couple hours between like three and five in the morning. Uh, then up about oh, up about seven. Then out, out and about, uh, out to the projects, out to St. Swillen, make sure everything's going good there. Uh, we're actually quite quiet just now on, on the kind of refurb stage. Uh, I had a point where we were doing like seven refurbs at the same time. So that was, uh, it was interesting. It was interesting for sure. How are you, uh, you getting on with tradesmen at the moment? Are they still coming back to you? Because like even guys that I've worked with, like painters and stuff for years and years and giving them loads of work, I can't even get them. They're like, ah, no, I'll be like six weeks by the time I get around to you. And you're like, what? I've given you all this work all through the times when you're quiet. Do you know what I mean? It's It's been... <laughs> the guys are okay, yeah. We're, we're actually in the middle. Like last, last, last March, we kind of... We're actually a company for doing our own kind of contractual work. So we're trying to basically take our the contracts that we've used in the past. We're actually trying to take them on now slowly, part by part, full time into the company. So okay. we're trying to kind of mitigate that kind of uh, struggling to find a tradesman. Thing. It's definitely the biggest pain point right now through, so, well, I mean, so I suppose for everyone else that can't find deals, maybe that's the biggest pain point, but for us that I've got plenty of deals sitting there, it's, it's actually getting the trades, getting the materials, getting them done, you know, in decent budget, in a timely manner and, and, and getting them is a nightmare. So I think it's a, I think it's a good, a good business model to keep your businesses flowing by employing the guys full time. For, for, for sure. I mean, the, guys, the guys are all great to work with. Uh, it's just trying to get them now to kind of move on board with us full time. Then, then there's like, I mean, that's interesting. That that'd be great to have that to call on. But then you're entering a whole new kind of uh, ball game of being a, an employer now. And then you've got like, you know, the kind of the sick days and the duvet days and <laughs> the. Uh, um, I've been I've been called by Track and Trace because I've been in contact with somebody who's got COVID, and then they're off for ten days. Oh man, yeah, that's it's something that's held me back a wee bit in terms of growing taking on staff because you just obviously you think to yourself that comes with so many other issues but I, I, I totally agree Nick but I think to enable to grow you need to start taking on people full time there's only so many hours in a day you can, you can kind of uh, put towards the property stuff if you want yeah. to you can kind of grow you need to take on people full time for sure definitely it's like you have to take you, know? you find anybody yet Stephen I know you yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. stand in a couple of weeks time fantastic brilliant yeah no, it's, it's, it's a really good point, Chris, about growing as well and, and, and kind of expanding and uh, taking on people to kind of relieve the burden off the things that you do daily. So, I'll, um, so speaking of expanding, where's what's the bigger picture for for Chris Goyman and his kind of group of companies? Where's the where's the what's the end goal or you got anything in mind? So obviously they've got uh, the kind of uh, the refurb side, uh, the contractual side. Uh, we'll throw that probably this year. Uh, also got uh, staging business that I've got on my to-do list, my goals for this year to launch. Uh, really hoping to actually launch that with uh, our other business partners, kind of Eric and Kiki, uh, 
the design she's doing on the properties in Aberdeen is fantastic. They've got they've actually got an Airbnb in the Ferry Hill Terrace in Aberdeen. And it's done to such a standard, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's absolutely stunning. So we're, we're very much on the same kind of, kind of wavelength and how we like things get done and the quality we're trying to, trying to produce. So trying to work, work, trying to work with them to be staging would be, be, be fantastic. And if you're on portfolio and your own, your own deals? Uh, on the list for this year, we've got an HMO and also a portfolio for this year. So I've got six months to pull my finger out and get, get going with that. You're looking good. Yeah. Busy, another busy year for you then. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. We've also, got, you... an, we've also got an eye on a, a commercial premises, another commercial premises, quite, quite a beastly one. Uh, I won't give too much details away just now because it's kind of just 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 getting started. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were saying to me the other day that you you, you thought your goals weren't um, big enough for this year. No, I don't think they are because we're we're in June and uh, I've hit, hit most of my targets so far. Mm -hmm. And obviously the missus has been pregnant, had the kids come along, so a lot of my time's been kind of taken away from doing property stuff. So I think for next year goals, I need to pull up my socks and uh, aim a little bit higher. Nice mate, it's good. Looking forward to seeing it. Awesome. Now it's really good to hear, and uh, it's it's great to, you know, now that you've got kids as well, and the twins have come along. Going back to that original point where, you know, Stephen's talking about missing out on birthdays and things like that. It's great to hear that you've now created this life for yourself where you're not going to be missing out on anything. So, uh, hopefully, it'll be all worthwhile for you. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, I don't, I don't think we would have had the family if uh, I'd still been working offshore. Yeah. Just, uh, again, you, you miss half the life growing up, so. Yeah, and you, and you lump a whole lot on your, your partner as well to deal with. Deal Absolutely, with yeah. Two kids while you're offshore for half, half your life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some people would love that, each their own, but um, <laughs> I, why start a family if you're not going to be there to be a dad and raise them, eh? Exactly, yeah. I'm sure this podcast will hit, will hit home to quite a lot of people who are in that situation. Uh, so yeah, thanks for being so honest, mate, and coming on. It's been good to hear your story. I know. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, mate. Let us, let, can you let the listeners know where they can reach out to you, even though you don't post very much? But hopefully, you will do it soon. I will. <laughs> if, they, if they make contact, I will get back to them. I will. Uh, you can catch up with me, Chris Goimer, on Instagram or Facebook. Great yeah. stuff. Super. Thanks, Chris. Much nice you, mate. Thank you. Cheers. Right, so I hope you enjoyed that interview with Chris. It was great having another guest on who, you you know, you can learn a little bit about with somebody who's not all over social media, so what, not one of the kind of names that's going to pop up in your Instagram feed, but there's so many people out there that are doing big things, and you'll find that a lot in property as well. You know, there's so many people who, you know, shout about things who are not actually doing the action, but then there's loads of people just operate under the radar who are actually producing phenomenal uh, results. So we want to try and find more of these people. So if any of you guys uh, want to come on the podcast, if you're doing good things, or if you know anybody, then please get in touch. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's a really good way of summing that up, actually. Um, a bit like Alex Walker we had on a few weeks ago, you know, phenomenal portfolio 135 house it was you know huge portfolio and again under the radar not on social media not shouting about it but very humble guy um doing the do so yeah we like we like having these guys on because they share some real insights and it's real life they don't they're, they're not here to sell you something you know they're just they're just sharing their knowledge their experience and, the, and their thought process so it's i like interviewing guys like this i think a lot of things is that you find as well with the podcast is that that there's there's usually People that come on that speak very well, they've always got something to sell. You know, they're either a coach, a mentor, or there's, there's always some sort of reason why they're trying to promote themselves as well. And that's why I like getting on guys like Chris, because really there's there's nothing to, you know, he's not trying to sell, sell himself really. Okay, he will be getting looking for investment one day. But, you know, that's what I love. Uh, that's what I love about these sorts of guests. So, yeah. Yep. Let, yeah, let us know what you think, guys. Leave us a review and let us know if you've got if you have any other guests on mind that you'd like to have us on. Take care. Bye for now.